afternoon, and we want to welcome all of you here. Thank you for coming today. We know you all have a busy day. We've got busy days, but uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, I'm Congressman Randy Forbes from Virginia's 4th Congressional District, and I have the privilege of chairing the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee. I'm joined today with a friend of mine, the Chairman of the House uh, Armed Services Committee Subcommittee on Readiness, uh, Rob uh, Whitman from Virginia's 1st District. Uh, we're going to be brief in just our opening comments so that we can give you as much time as uh, you need for any questions that you might have. As all of you know, we're facing this looming uh, deadline for sequestration. Um, I have always felt sequestration was a bad idea. I felt it was a bad idea when the President proposed it. I voted against it. I fought to um, try to get the President not to sign it. I lost both of those fights. After that, Rob and I have actually been working the last year uh, with other members of Congress trying to raise the awareness of sequestration across the country when very few people were talking about it. We launched an event in Virginia approximately a year ago to try to begin raising these questions and to find a solution to sequestration. We have uh, traveled across the country, uh, tried to talk to people and let them know that we would be right here uh, today where we are. We believe that sequestration is going to have an enormous impact, not just economically in Virginia. We will probably suffer more than any state, but also from a strategic point of view, any way you look at it, we have a perfect storm. We're hearing people talk about sequestration, but we need to put in context it's really three things that are happening right now to national defense in this country. The first one is, as many of you know, we have already taken over a half trillion dollars of cuts to national defense. I think that was far too many cuts to, to make. Uh, they were done in a point that I think put us in a very, very difficult point in time strategically. As many of you know, even before we get to sequestration, the Army was about ready to cut over 80,000 individuals from the Army. Uh, we didn't hear anything from the Army for the last year or so since sequestration passed relative to those cuts. Um, then in addition to that, as we know with our ships, uh, we have had an independent panel that's talked about the fact that we needed 346 ships in the Navy. Uh, based on testimony we've had before both of our subcommittees, we know that uh, testimony has been that our combatant commanders would need a fleet as, as high as 400 to 500 ships. Um, the uh, Navy has always said we at least needed uh, 313 ships. They've now reduced that uh, to 306. If you look, there's some double counting, so really about 300 and their budgets are taking them down below that 300 figure. In addition to that, the 300 figure only reaches there in 2038, a long time down the road. And to get there, they've had to increase the deployments uh, for our men and women in uniform from six months deployments to seven month deployments. All of that before we even get to the point of sequestration. And the final part of that is the Air Force has testified they've been in a declining state of readiness since 2003 and yet we have another half trillion dollar cut um, that we have seen coming to the Air Force. That brings us to where we are today, which is in addition to those cuts, we have the fact that we passed a defense appropriates bill out of the House. The Senate's failed to pass a defense appropriations bill, as many of you know, and the Navy says that what's really hurting them right now is the lack of a budget coming from the Senate. So we add that to the fact that in just a few days, we'll now have sequestration, which is another half trillion dollars of cuts uh, that will go to our national defense, and we think that is a bridge too far. So what have we tried to do? Well, in addition to going across the country and raising this awareness, uh, we have uh, tried to work on the House leadership, and they have successfully passed two bills that would stop sequestration uh, last summer, as many of you know. Senate has failed to put forward a single bill up to this point in time, and the President has not put a single proposal forward. In addition to that, uh, since we didn't get acceptance of either of those two bills, the Senate hadn't put anything forward, and the President hasn't put anything forward, I filed a bill this week that would say this. Uh, you remember the President, when we were talking about tax rates, he uh, used the phrase, he said, we ought to at least be able to find what we agree upon and get that off the table. Well, it looks like to me, if you polled members of the Senate and the House, they all agree on one thing. Sequestration seems to be a bad idea for national defense. If that's the case, we've written a very simple bill that just says, as to national defense, uh, sequestration would not apply. We filed that bill. We hope that, if nothing else, we could get that bill passed. It wouldn't put the cuts on everyone else. It would leave it up to the appropriators, but it would just say we're not going to use this arbitrary situation that we have 
to uh, deal with sequestration. Final uh, two points for me before I turn it over to uh, uh, Congressman uh, Whitman is uh, the fact that, as many of you know, the President has traveled to Virginia today to one of our shipyards. Um, I think it's always good when the President comes to Virginia to visit any of our shipyards. The question you, I leave to you is to ask uh, this, um, whether or not the President can fix sequestration in a shipyard in Virginia. If he can, I wish he'd have been there a year ago so we wouldn't have to have this unstable situation we currently have. The likelihood, however, of fixing it there is remote. I would suggest that where the President would probably be better uh, spending his time is here in Washington actually meeting with people who disagree with him so that he can try to get a resolution and hopefully some sort of compromise. Last thing is that word I just used, compromise. We hear a lot of people talking about that. The President loves to use it. One of the things many of us are mature enough to know today is this, that if you take the wrong medicine to try to cure an illness, it can sometimes be worse than taking no medicine. If you have the wrong compromise, it can be worse than no compromise at all. And I want to point out to everybody that the BCA itself, sequestration, the problem that we're all now facing, was in fact a compromise, a compromise that was uh, proposed by the President. And even though I voted against it, we're looking at it and facing it today. Last thing I want to look uh, or to, to point out to you is this. Many people ask, why is it so difficult to get a compromise in Washington? Well, we'll just throw three points uh, from the President because he is our Commander in Chief. The first one is, is simply this. It's very difficult to reach compromises when you consistently move the goalpost. As you all know, with the BCA, that was supposed to be a compromise. I have a list of quotes from the President and other people in the White House talking about the fact it was a, um, comprom a compromise. But no sooner than it got passed, as you know, all of a sudden you started moving the goalpost and trying to get more revenue in. Secondly, just a month or so ago, we had a big uh, debate, crisis time coming out for whether we were going to increase tax rates. There was a compromise on that. The ink hadn't gotten dry yet before all of a sudden the goalposts were moved on that. Second thing is this. Um, the President uh, has uh, really um, a difficult time talking to people who don't agree with him. So if you'll see, instead of the President bringing uh, individuals in Congress who might disagree with him and sit down and talk to them to see if they can resolve those differences, the President instead has surrounded himself with these campaign stops where he puts people who already agree with him around to cheer and clap everything he says. But if you want to reach true compromise, the best way to do that is go in a room with people who might disagree with you and try to just listen for a moment and see if you can reach a compromise. Third and final thing is this. Uh, it, the best way to get a compromise is not to think that everybody who disagrees with you is some type of villain. And that's the way the President seems to put it when he goes out and he attacks every Republican, almost 50 percent of the electorate across the country, just because they disagree with him, he has to impugn their motives and impugn uh, their analytical abilities. So I hope the President, after he has the campaign event he has today, will come back to Washington, sit down with us, and hopefully we can get a campaign, I mean, some sort of compromise that will stop sequestration from taking place. So with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Chairman Whitman, Whitman who will talk to you about some of the specificity of the dangers of sequestration itself. Thanks, Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Chairman Forbes, thank you. Thanks for your uh, eloquent laying out of the issue that's before us. Uh, just as you see here, a couple of weeks ago we asked the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant of the Marine Corps if this was the picture of things to come. Five aircraft carriers in port, four large deck amphibs in port. Our large portion of our naval presence there, not at sea, sailors at the dock, if that was the scope of things to come, and their answer to us was yes. If the sequestration went into effect, that we could expect more of this in the future. Aircraft carriers not being deployed, new aircraft carriers not being built, current ones not being refueled, that to me is significant. That cuts right to the issue of readiness. And we heard there from all the service branch chiefs the issue of readiness, and they termed it as a readiness crisis the inability for this nation to respond to the threats that are out there around the globe in a way that assures that we can be victorious in whatever situation that we face. That to me, deeply, deeply concerning. And I appreciate the President traveling today, being right across the river from the Norfolk Naval Base. 
being there at Newport News Shipbuilding. So he understands the greatest ships in the world are built there by the best shipbuilders in the world and the commitment that it takes from them to do that job, how important the industrial base is to this nation, how important our civilian employees are within DOD and our contracting community. All of those individuals are part of what would be affected by this sequestration. And the president speaks about compromise, putting those ideas on the table. I couldn't agree more. Let's find that common ground. Let's make sure we find ways to do that. And I have to agree 100% with the president's thought of a balanced approach. And the balanced approach is this. We have had $600 billion in tax increases that just passed in January without any reductions in spending. Now is the time to have the reductions in spending. That balance needs to be there. The balance is not there to this point. That's why we urge the president to be part of the discussion about how do we come up with those reductions. We're talking about reducing our overall budget by 2.4 percent. Certainly that is doable. We have a budget of over $3.6 trillion. If we cannot achieve that, that level of reduction, which just decreases the rate of increase. It doesn't even get us below uh, where we are from years past to today. We ought to be able to do that, and I, and I believe that we can do that. And we can do that in a way that's thoughtful, in a way that's not disruptive to our military, in a way that doesn't tie the leaders of our military's hands in the things that they need to do, allows them to put forward their priorities to make sure that they are doing what's necessary for all the service branches to do the job that they are charged with doing. And again, I go back to the issue of readiness. All of them have said this will severely impact readiness, their ability to meet those threats around the world. To me, that's pretty indicative of what we have before us, and that is to make sure that the reductions across the budget are done in a mindful way. And just as Congressman Forbes has, has spoken of, we talk about a balanced approach. The balance ought to be in looking in other areas of the budget. In 2011, $487 billion in reductions were placed in the defense budget. Now's the time to look at other areas of the budget as far as achieving those savings to reduce the budget. And then once we go through that, if we want to come back and talk about defense and where we can be more efficient, I'm all for that. But we have to have the balanced approach, which means we have to talk about spending, and we have to talk about spending in the non-defense areas since we've already tread the waters of going into reducing spending on the defense side, and we've already tread the waters on reducing uh, or addressing the, the revenue side of the equation and having those increased revenues. So I really see that as the path forward for discussions and the president pl places out there the idea of balance. Uh, that truly is the balanced approach is to talk about those spending areas and specifically ways that we can look at offsetting the reductions proposed there on the defense budget side and especially too looking at not only where we can reduce the budgets in other places through savings and efficiencies, but also, too, looking at the, the current situation with spending within the Pentagon and making sure, too, that our leaders here have, have the ability to make sure that they meet this nation's priorities in making those spending decisions. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come before you today. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with Chairman Forbes, and we look forward to taking your questions. It would. Now, here, l let, me, let me give you two points on that. Sequestration, as you know, has two primary um, components that we dislike. One of them is the uh, severity of the cuts to national defense. The second one is the arbitrary way in which it does it. So what we're basically saying is we ought to all at least agree on the national security of the country. We don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. Which And this bill would, in a very simplistic form that everybody can understand, simply say that sequestration would not apply to national defense. The appropriators could still what, do whatever they wanted to do in terms of their budgets and, and, and adjusting the numbers anywhere they wanted to, but it would basically say that we're not going to use this kind of arbitrary approach when it comes to national defense. You know, when, when you look across the building we're in and, and the adjacent buildings, you always hear 
uh, muddled messages. In fact, some of my Democratic friends want to do away with huge segments of the defense budget completely. Not all of them do. Some of them have wanted the cuts that we've taken place. Some of them have fought against those cuts. If you look on the Republican side, we'll have some people that will talk in terms of overall cuts, and some of them look and in, in narrow in on defense. If I took the two items that you just raised, one of them would be overall spending across the budget. And, you know, we're not asking the president to stop spending. We're just asking him to moderate some of the spending. And as uh, Chairman Whitman uh, pointed out, we're talking about 2.4 percent in a budget the size of our budget. If that's going to bring the nation to its knees, then that's something we, we ought to all be very concerned about. But there's a whole different picture when we're talking about defense, because as Rob pointed out, Every single cut this administration has had so far has been defense. If, find me any other cuts that they've made anywhere else. They can make none. And so we're looking at a situation where they've made, and it wasn't just $487 billion. That was just the last uh, bite that they took out of the apple. But they've had well over a half trillion dollars of defense cuts already that they've taken. And then to overlay these defense cuts on top of that, I can tell you from the Sea Power Subcommittee, and I think Rob would agree from the Readiness Subcommittee, um, our national defense can't withstand that and still continue to have the kind of national defense we want to protect and defend this country. Let me just add, add one more statement to that. As, as Randy pointed out, there's already been a significant amount of reductions on the table, over a half a trillion dollars. If you then look at what the sequester puts in place, it is also disproportional. Now we're saying 50 percent of the cuts will take place in 20 percent of the budget. It's the disproportionality of what we're facing with cuts to our national defense that create that imbalance. The 2.4 percent number is an overall reduction of the budget, which really talks, I think, specifically to the point to say, if you spread those cuts out and defense is already taken, it's, it's, I think, fair share of those cuts. If you spread those out in other areas of the budget, it puts it in perspective about what we really need to do to get this in hand. And, and I think that's what we, what we have to remember from this is disproportionately the defense budget has been affected already in the last two years. This proposes to do even more there that creates this strategic imbalance for our forces. Well, I think from a military perspective, it does affect our readiness, and it affects our readiness because our military chiefs don't have the ability to place those cuts thoughtfully and methodically across the defense budget. They have to go through in a, in a baloney slice way and cut right across the board. So the things that are important to them, they don't get the ability to make a priority decision about where the funding needs to be placed or where the reductions need to be placed. So it ties their hands. It says, regardless of the importance of what you do, you got to cut everything, which doesn't make sense. That's, that's the illogical part of this, is the indiscriminate nature of these cuts. If they at least had the ability to say, well, based on my best judgment, here are some places where I could reduce the budget that would not have as much impact, this would make this less complicated. It still, though, exacerbates the issue, as we talked about, because this is another cut in a series of cuts that continues uh, to cut at the ability for our military to do the job it needs to do. And I hope one of the things we'll see is more people asking the question you just raised, but not just for sequestration. And I want to put this in context. We will mitigate a lot of the horror stories you're hearing out there with a CR with anomalies that will come in there. We, we can do a lot of that. But we still are going to have huge problems with national defense in terms of readiness and in terms of where we want to be. But it's not just sequestration. It's these cuts that have already taken place. As you know, the administration moved our land-based missile defense systems at, um, from Europe, and they put them on the back of the Navy, gave the Navy no additional resources. Well, one of the cuts that we're going to see is going to be availabilities to do BMD upgrades. So we're going to have a gap right there. As we mentioned in terms of ships that we're going to have on um, our overall shipbuilding plan, part of that is increasing the deployment times to seven months instead of six. That's a huge thing on the back of our men and women in uniform. And that's even without sequestration. 
in uh, by 2020, we will be outmanned in terms of submarines in the Pacific, 78 to 32 by the Chinese. None of those are good pictures for us right now. So what we're hoping is in addition to sequestration, we'll be looking at this in the context of these cuts that have already been taken to ask two questions. What can we afford to spend on defense? Fair question. That's been asked for the last four years. But the second question that hasn't been asked, what's the risk to the United States of America by not supplying these resources? Look, well, I, I think we need to know where we've come from to be able to know where we're going. It's fair, fair question, and you can put blame where you want. I could put the blame on the president for having proposed it. I don't think that does particularly a lot of good uh, to do that. I can put the blame on Congress for not reaching an agreement. Um, I can say all day long, I didn't vote for it, so don't blame me. But that doesn't help us. And, and one of the things that I do think you've got, as you know, and, and, and that we started out with, a bad compromise will be worse than no compromise at all. So, so the real difficulty that I think we have in Washington today is the inability for us to come in a room and listen to people who disagree with us and try to find not so much compromise but common ground. And the common ground we ought to be able to find today, if nothing else, is the national defense of this country. And that's what Rob and I are working on. I'm not asking anybody to compromise their principles. I'm just saying, can we sit in a room and talk instead of going out with press conferences and beating each other up. We're not beating anybody up. We're saying that this is something we need to do for the American people, sit in a room, see if we can find common ground. That's why this bill we've put in, um, you know, even though it's, it's where we are in time, uh, it at least says, as to national defense, can't we all just find common ground? We ought to take that off the table, if nothing else. Well, first of all, I, I didn't think the super committee was a good idea. That's why I voted against So I can't defend their failure or their success. Rob, I don't know if you want to comment about super committee. Yeah, I, I just want to add in there, Chad, too, at this particular point, the, the path that we've been over really now is inconsequential. At the time, it would have been. And, and certainly Congressman Forbes and myself were very vocal about the super committee needing to get their job done. That time has expired. Now we are where we are. We've also said Congress ought to be in session through August, September, October, be back in Washington working on things. All that time has expired too. Now we're here where we are through a series of, of events. And I think folks look at us out there and say, you know, we don't care who's at fault. We are looking at getting things done. I think folks, a lot of folks out there are in crisis fatigue. They said, well, why do we have to go from crisis to crisis to crisis? You all need to find that common ground as Chairman Forbes spoke of and get these things done. And that's really where, where we are today. I mean, we can look it back and analyze about how we got here, but the reality is this is where we are. And we have the obligation to this nation, to our men and women that serve this nation, to our DOD civilian employees, and to the great contractor workforce out there, as well as this nation's national defense needs to get this done. This is one of those things at the top of the list. And, you know, when you raise your hand, and swear to uphold the Constitution. You look there, and that's one of the top things that we have is our job, and that is to defend this nation and provide for its armies and navies. That's our job. That's what people out there expect us to do, and they expect us to make the tough decisions. Here we are at the 11th hour needing to do that, and that's why we're here is talking about there are opportunities out there for us to get that done. Let's do just that. And we're not going to rely on the super committee or no. the president anybody else. And, and understand, this comes back to your question, even – when March 1st comes and sequestration hits, we're not going to rest. We're not going to say, oh, that's it. We're going to continue right. to work and make sure we're mitigating some of these consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, I know both Congressman Forbes and myself have been involved in those conversations with the leadership, both uh, at the committee level of appropriations and with the, with the conference leadership about how would we go about doing that. 
There's concerns about just giving carte blanche transfer authority and say, we'll move money wherever you want. Uh, Chairman Forbes and myself have been part of a discussion to say, let's identify the priorities within the service branches, determine where the money is needed to really address the most uh, severe and timely needs, and let's put together a CR that allows that to be very specific so that we understand how we're going to meet those needs. That's part of the discussion going forward. I know Chairman Forbes has been, been an integral part of that. And, Randy, I don't know if you yeah, want to you, say anything. You remember how when sequestration came up, you all had to run back and pull out your dictionaries and say, <laughs> what in the world is sequestration? Well, pull them out for the word anomaly because yeah, uh, yeah. next week that's what you're going to be looking at as we start working at CRs and trying to put anomalies in that will help do just what you said to allocate those um, um, budget items into the lines that uh, the service chiefs need so that they won't have to do quite the horror stories that we're hearing today. And I think we're going to be able to mitigate an awful lot of that uh, in that process. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, everybody, Thanks, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Great job.